Good morning, everybody, and welcome to D.C. Church, to our West Portsmouth campus. Is everybody doing okay this morning? Yes? I I think you're cheering because it's a three-day weekend. It's Labor Day weekend, and so... Anyway, we are so grateful that you've come and you've come to worship with us this morning. You know, we're going to just take this time. We're going to come as the body of Christ. We're going to lift praises of, of worship and song to our King this morning for what he has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. He's so, so good to us, right? He's so, so good to us. So let's stand this morning and let's sing of the goodness of God.
are called to magnify Christ. We are called to be little Christs. And as we continue to grow in our knowledge and in our faith of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to let him work through us and so that others may see the power of Jesus Christ. So this is a new song we're going to introduce to you this morning. Try and sing it with us. We're creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry from north to south and east to west we'd hear christ be magnified be magnified in us lord please
Let's sing of how deep the Father's love is for us this morning. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing all. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen. Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Cal, and I will accept that subdued greeting after I've been away for the week. I will accept it. You know, I've heard a phrase a lot in the past few months, which has been, 2020 is the worst. 2020 is the worst, you know? And so this week I went to Disney World. Right? My goal was to play golf three times, okay? And uh, I played once and got rained out. I got rained out totally once and played once and it was really wet. So I didn't quite go ironically for the reason I did originally want to go, but I did a lot of this. So I did a lot of thinking while I did this about, you know, 2020 is the worst and is it really that bad? And 
you know, honestly, I felt safer in Disney World than I do going to the grocery store. It kind of gave me a lot of hope and humanity, just seeing people obey rules, be respectful, be distanced and everything else. And I was thinking about you all and about our church and the future and just history in general and thinking 2020 is the worst. Is that really true? Is that a fair approximation of reality? And people are asking me, Cal, how's Disney World? How was the plane ride? Was it safe? Were you okay? And I'm writing stuff back like, well, it wasn't that bad. It was okay. Here's the truth. I was on vacation. The words, it wasn't that bad, it's a terrible way to describe your vacation. If that should never happen. I'm eating great food. I'm going on cool theme park rides. I'm playing golf. I'm with my family. The weather is overall pretty good, you know. How can it be? It wasn't that bad. It was actually really good. I was on vacation, right? And so there are people in this room who've lived through terrible things. You told me your stories. You've seen things in history that I can't even imagine having to go through. There's even a man in our church at the Deep Creek campus who was in a prisoner of war camp in World War II in Eastern Europe. I mean, how much worse can you get than that? And we say stuff like 2020 is the worst. And I think to myself, do I have any understanding of history? Do I have any understanding about how good my life is and how blessed that I am? I know we have problems and I know life is hard, but I think it's important to have perspective. And I think the Bible, the Word of God, can give us perspective about ourselves, but also about history that we desperately need. So we got a great message from Jason and I this morning. And uh, I am so happy to hear from him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the year 2020. We may be going through hard things as a nation, the virus, uh, some political issues, unrest, problems in our personal lives, but people have faced many hard things before. Your people, God, your people, people who belong to Jesus Christ, who were washed clean by him, have been the lowest of the low in the world. They've been slaves. They've been captives. They've been the poorest of the poor. They've gone through hard things, had disease in the past and, and problems. But you've always loved them and you've given them a hope in this life and beyond, no matter the problems they're going through. And so I pray for us now. Will you open our hearts, Holy Spirit, to hear from Jason, to hear the message that you've given him, that he will bless us with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say good morning to all of you and welcome. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to come and open God's Word. Obviously, this isn't something that I get to do with you often, usually up here with a microphone and a guitar, and that's my, that's my safe zone, right? That's my comfort zone. But this is a great opportunity to open the Word of God with you, and I'm really excited about it. So today we're going to look at Exodus chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, you want to start to turn, turn there, you can do that. You know, just before Pastor Ernie went on vacation, he approached me and he said, you know, Jason, would you, would you like to preach over at the West Portsmouth campus? And I said, well, yeah, I'd love to. That, that'd be great. Thank you for the opportunity. And I said, is there anything you want me to preach on? And he said, uh, you have permission to preach on whatever you want. So there's 66 books in the Bible, and I can't even think about how many chapters or verses are in the Bible as well. But what I decided was uh, a year ago, actually a year ago this time, uh, I just kind of felt the Lord pressing on my heart to spend some really ample time in the, New, the Old Testament, studying the Old Testament, the, the laws, the covenants, everything that God put in place that would eventually lead up to the New Testament. And so that's what I've been doing for an entire year is just spending some really deep time in the Old Testament. And I just happened to be walking through the book of Exodus over the months of July and August. And there was a really, a really impactful chapter um, that spoke to my heart. And so I thought I'd like to bring that to you this morning. Now, why do we study the Old Testament? I mean, growing up in middle school and high school, um, I, I even wondered, why is the Old Testament part of the Bible? Jesus isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament, or at least to my very feeble, uh, unknowing mind, right? Um, but what the Old Testament is, is a, a beautiful piece of document um, that, 
that talks about uh, God and what he did to redeem his chosen people. And ultimately, what he would do to bring the prophesied coming Savior of the world, who is Jesus Christ. You know, um, we as New Testament believers um, have a great uh, privilege now that we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. But if we look at the Old Testament, we see that God set up his chosen people, the Israelites. And then under the new covenant of Jesus Christ and his blood and what he did on the cross for us, we now have the opportunity, the ability to be grafted in to the fold of who God has chosen. I remember growing up as a kid and my dad was really into this very unique uh, art form. It was a Japanese art form by the name of bonsai. And if you don't know what bonsai is, uh, it literally means tray planting. Okay, Jason, you've still not described what that means. Basically what bonsai was, was taking small plants and small trees and cutting them and shaping them and growing them to be a miniature model of, of the larger tree, specifically the arching uh, type of Japanese trees. I don't remember the name of them. But what was so cool was watching him take uh, metal wire and, and wrap it around the limbs of the tree to shape them and make them look uh, like these large trees, but in a miniature plant. And one of the coolest techniques that I ever got to watch him do was something called grafting, where he would chop off a limb, take that limb and move it to another part of the tree. And this is done by slicing into the trunk of the tree adding that limb back in and wrapping it. And what happens over time is as the tree grows and matures, that limb is now 100% part of that tree. And so that's the beauty of what we experience as New Testament believers. We are grafted in to this beautiful people that God has already called and chosen. So let's go ahead and look at Exodus chapter 16. Now it's 10 verses. I hope you can hang with me for 10 verses, okay? But the verses will be on the screen for you if you need. So here we go. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. That's not a figurative, uh, a figure of speech. That's just literally the name of this desert, right? Which is between Elam and Sinai. And it was on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. Now this date is very important. Uh, if we were to go back just a few chapters when they left Egypt, it said that they left on the 15th day of the first month. So now we know that this context here, this helps us know they've been traveling for exactly one month, okay? Verse 2, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Now who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread that you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling Verse 10, 
While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in a cloud. So as New Testament believers, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, A, it's important for us to understand and know the context of what's happening here for, for the Israelites, but also as we read it as New Testament believers, I think it's important for us to take these 10 verses and decide what is, what's the main idea or what is it that God wants to teach us this morning through these 10 verses. And I think it's simply put this way. If I am only focused on myself, then I can miss God's grace, provision, and glory. Now here's what I'm not saying, okay? Don't read into this. I'm not saying... God will withhold those things because I don't believe that's who God is. But what I am saying is that if my eyes are only focused on myself, I can miss what God wants to do in and around me, right? So let's go ahead and unpack these uh, verses here in just a minute. Before I do that, I was thinking about this. The reason this whole message stirred up in my heart uh, several weeks ago was um, the hurricane, the hurricane that came through our area. Everyone remembers the hurricane or, or the tropical depression or whatever it was, okay? So we know it's coming, wake up, it's 4.30 in the morning and everybody's phone, I'm sure yours like mine, is going nuts because there's tornadoes all around us, right? And so we wake up, we get our kids to a safe spot, and as we are doing that, our power goes out. Now, something you should know about my house and my community, if we get a 10 mile an hour breeze flowing around our house, the power goes out. I don't know if we're on an old power grid or what, but we have just gotten used to losing power. Now, there's a community that sits right behind my house, no more than 27 feet away from the back of my house, and two people that you know and love uh, in this congregation live in that community, and their names are Andrew and Ashley Shea. Their community never loses power, ever. How can we be 27 feet away and they never lose power? So it's 4.30 in the morning, we are getting our family to a safe spot, and I go to my, uh, my hallway window upstairs looking out at that community going, it's, today's the day, today's the day. <laughs> And the wind and the rain is going sideways outside the window, but I see the lights on inside and outside their homes, and they begin to flicker and flicker. And I'm going, come on, come on, turn off. And wouldn't you know it, it turned off. But then 30 seconds later, it came right back on. I don't believe in karma, but I think for that one moment, there was karma in my house because those lights came right back on and stayed on for the entire day. We were without power for 14 and a half hours, and I actually know there's people in this room that were out for longer than that. And so, here's the point. I grumbled. I grumbled. I was so concerned about myself. I was so focused on me that I was, I was willing to do a rain dance to see somebody else's power go out, right? So Andrew and Ashley, I'm sorry for wishing that on you, but I really hope you lose power one day just to see what it's like. <laughs> it's not fun, okay? So as we move on this morning then, if I'm only focused on myself, I can miss God's grace in my life. I want to read to you verses 2 and 3 once again. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the, Lord, the, the hand of the Lord in Egypt. Listen to what they say. This is what they're most concerned about. There we sat around pots of meat, and we had all the fill that we want, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve us. You see, what the Israelites are doing in this moment is they are solely focused on themselves and the here and the now. We have the privilege of knowing what happens to the Israelites. 
God takes them to the promised land. The land that's flowing with milk and honey. The the land that He set apart for the Israelites, right? But they're so focused on this moment where they don't have food right now that they forget that they've just been led out of slavery and bondage. You see, this is God's grace that they were missing because they were solely focused on themselves. Now in this moment, Moses has just become a convenient scapegoat for the Israelites. They were so focused on themselves that they had no knowledge of what was to come in the future. Now, I've been listening to this pastor by the name of Sandy Adams out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he's been preaching through the book of Exodus as I've been reading through it as well. And he has this great quote that I I have kind of grown to just embrace and, and say it out loud in my head as much as possible. And it talks about our selfishness and specifically this chapter. He says this, When we swear, we take the Lord's name in vain. When we swear, we take the Lord's name in vain. But when we grumble, we take the purposes of the Lord in vain. When we grumble, we take the purposes of the Lord in vain. You see, when we begin to complain about the circumstances that we find ourselves in, when we begin to complain about the resources that we've received, if we, if we begin to complain about the direction that God is leading us, or even better yet, if we begin to complain about the authority that God has set up over us, we are not complaining against man. We're complaining against God. We are grumbling against God. If we in this room who are saved, who have, meaning we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and believe that our God is a sovereign God, meaning He is totally in control of our lives, then when things don't go the way that we want, or the circumstances change from the way we want them to be, what are we saying about God? What are we saying about God when we begin to complain about the things in our lives? In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, the Apostle Paul talks about it, about God's grace specifically in this way. He says, I have become a servant servant of the gospel. And that was a gift of God's grace. I don't know about you, but my thinking almost never is, thank you God that your grace has now made me a servant. It's really hard to think like that. But how about this? What if we, by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, what if we stopped viewing God's grace, which we are so thankful for God's grace, right? God's grace has saved us, redeemed us, keeps us within the will of God. Perhaps the most famous song has ever been written about God's grace, amazing grace. And I'm not suggesting that we in this room do this, but I'm sure that perhaps there are people that do. If, what if we stop viewing God's grace as a get-out-of-hell-free card and more started viewing God's grace as making us servants of the gospel and believing that that is a true gift. I think if we started thinking this way, it would shift our thinking from me, 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 I, 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 to him, 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 her, her, her. I think it would change the way we view our neighbors our friends, and our co-workers who do not know Jesus. So if I'm solely focused on myself, I can miss God's grace in my life. Not only can I miss God's grace in my life, but I can miss God's sufficient provision in my life. God's sufficient provision. Let me read verse 4 to you once again. Verse 4 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them 
and see whether they will follow my instructions. Here's what God wanted for the Israelites. He wanted them to trust daily. Daily trust. And how was he going to do that? If we were to continue reading on in chapter 16, we would see that God provides a bread-like substance called manna and meat, which was a migrating bird called quail. And he gave that to them each and every day. Now, God told the Israelites to only take what they needed for that day. And it was a specific amount. It was one omer, which in our measurements today is seven pints, okay? So they were only to collect seven pints of manna per day. Now manna was this miraculous bread um, that God would place on the floor, the ground floor, and in the morning as the dew would lift, the manna would be spread out and they would go and they would collect what they needed. Now, if we were to continue reading on, we would find that when people began to hoard more than what they were asked to get, the manna would begin to spoil. As the sun would rise, it would melt, it would begin to rot, and it would stink, and the worms would begin to cling to the manna. And so in this way, God wanted to see that his people would trust them daily for what they were supposed to receive. I want to read to you uh, John chapter 6, um, just a few verses, 28 to 30 something, okay? And what we're picking up here in John chapter 6 is a story that you all know where Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? Where he takes five loaves of bread and two fish and feeds the 5,000. And which we know from scholars, there's even more people than that. But here we see a conversation happening between both, um, both Jesus and his disciples, okay? So verse 28 says this, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, check this out, is to believe in the one he sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? You know, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, check this out. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And what does Jesus say? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. God wants us to trust in Him daily for His specific and sufficient provision. How did Jesus teach us to pray as He was teaching His disciples? He said, give us this day our daily bread. And in Matthew 6, 33, He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. You see, there's many things in our lives, if we're not careful, that can keep us from trusting in the sufficient provision of Jesus. A hefty bank account. Oftentimes, we can trust in the surplus rather than the Savior. The things we own, the possessions that we have. And none of these things are bad. But when they take precedent and when they take um, priority in our lives then we are walking away from what God has called us to do, to trust Him. So not only if I'm focused on myself, can I miss God's grace and God's specific and sufficient provision. Lastly, we can miss God's glory in our lives. 
We all have experienced God's glory in one way or another, and we could go around the room and you could tell stories of what God has done in and through your life. One way that I'm sure we all have experienced God's glory is through His creation, how He has created majestic, beautiful, wonderful things. I'll never forget when I was eight or nine years old, my parents took me on a trip to Montana. And that was one of the most amazing experiences I have ever witnessed. Um, we got to go on little excursions through Yellowstone National Park. We got to watch the Old Faithful Geyser, and we got to see some of the most uh, amazing, wild, and majestic animals. One thing I experienced, which was really quite sad as an eight-year-old, was watching a brown bear, I believe a grizzly bear, who had captured a small deer and was dragging it up a hill. And it was still alive and crying, and it was really, really sad. But that is God's creation, right? That is nature, and that is His glory on display. But the pinnacle of God's glory, the pinnacle of God's glory, is in the work and in the person of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, who was obedient to the Father, decided that his life must be laid down for his creation. And you and I are the recipients of God's glory in our lives because of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. You see, we can tie this whole message up and one thing, in the cross. Because it's in the cross that we see God's grace. It's in the cross that we see God's provision. And it is in the cross that we see God's glory. So what is our response this morning as we prepare to close here? Our response is this. Let's think about the old hymn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I want you to listen to the lyrics here. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I want to close with this, just a reminder, or just, just think about the example of Peter, where Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. And he said, Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus said, come. Peter's eyes were locked on Jesus. Locked on Jesus. And you all know the story. What happened when Peter took his eyes off Jesus? He sank. He allowed his circumstances to crowd out the Savior. So here's my encouragement to us this morning, and then I'm going to pray and our band can come on up. My encouragement is this. with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, not by pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, okay? With the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, seek the face of Jesus. And there you will see His grace, His provision, and His glory in your lives. So let's pray. Father God, I love You and I praise You and I thank You for all that You do in our lives. God, my prayer this morning as we close out this morning is, um, is that God, You would help us through the power of Your Holy Spirit to focus on You. That God, we would witness and recognize that God, You have amazing grace. You have sufficient 
provision and your ultimate pinnacle of glory, which is Jesus Christ, on display for us through the cross. I pray, God, that we would seek those things, that we would trust in those things, and that, God, we would take our eyes off ourselves and our circumstances and place them solely on You. Help us to turn our eyes on You, Lord. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, I come, I confess, that bowing here, I find my rest. Because without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. When sin runs deep, your grace is more. Your grace is found, is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free and holy. Is Christ in me? And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you cause Jesus you're my hope and stay and Lord I need you oh I Amen. What a great, great message that Jason gave to us this morning. I was, I was very encouraged. I know like you were 
by that message. Um, so, little plug here, connect groups, okay? We are doing some, hopefully more connect groups in the coming weeks. And so, maybe your group is not meeting right now. That's okay. Maybe you still want to go to a group. That's more than okay. Come talk to me. I will get you into a good group for you to fit into for the time being and maybe even forever. And uh, Jason, will you be at the back door to say goodbye to everyone as, as they leave? I'm going to close this in prayer. Lord God, thank you so much that you are, are unchanging and that our, our grumbling, our, our complaints about life, they, they tell us a lot more about our relationship with you than we may even want to believe. But I just, I pray, God, that you use the Word of God, you use the book of Exodus and the experience of the, of, of the Israelites to, to prune us, to make us a, the, the kind of graft that we ought to be. We are a part of this new great work that you're doing, God, and, and, and just help us to be worthy of that calling, to root out evil in our lives and take it away and, and make us the kind of graft we ought to be. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.